Hello, everybody. I'm Alex Fraser. I'm the Chief Executive of the London Institute of Banking and Finance. And today I'm delighted to be speaking to Bashir Siman, who is a member of our International Advisory Board. Bashir wears many hats, but the one that we're going to focus on today is his role as Head of Financial Diplomacy at the Brussels Diplomatic Academy, which is based within the university VUB. And I wonder, Bashir, if we could start by you talking a bit about uh, that academy and your role within it and the part that financial diplomacy plays. Sure. Well, thank you very much for um, uh, hosting me today. And um, the um, um, Vreya Universiteit Brussel, as it is called in Flemish, the VUB, is the um, uh, Flemish incarnation in uh, 1971 of the um, already um, established ULB, Université Libre de Bruxelles, the French speaking um, uh, original university, which was established in 1834. The uh, Brussels Diplomatic Academy within the VUB uh, was established in 2013 with the aim, and that is important, I think, for our conversation uh, of providing um, the applied side of um, the craft of diplomacy uh, rather than the purely theoretical, whether it's legal or international relations, or politics and so forth. And to that effect, um, the BDA, the Brussels Diplomatic Academy, which is um, supported by the uh, foreign ministry and by various other uh, entities, uh, in the private sector as well as the public sector, is divided into what is called pillars, really sort of roughly equivalent to departments. Um, each pillar uh, then focuses on a particular um, expertise area in the increasingly uh, segmented uh, world of uh, diplomatic uh, work. So in addition to financial diplomacy, there is, for example, energy, there is um, uh, technology, technology and diplomacy. Uh, there are um, areas of geographic interest, for example, Latin America, um, uh, the Middle East and so forth. Um, the aim of um, the uh, financial diplomacy pillar is to is really threefold. One is to bring um, the specific applied aspects of um, diplomatic work in the area of finance, uh, regulatory cooperation uh, at a global scale, um, and um, uh, the various areas to do with uh, trade and services and financial services uh, to a uh, wide uh, audience. That means not just the graduate student body uh, in international relations, law, business, and so forth, but also to diplomats, civil servants, officials, and executives in the private sector, whether it's from Belgium or from um, across the world. And in fact, the faculty of uh, BDA is um, extremely diverse and very international, uh, as you would expect. Um, so in, in, the, uh, uh, in, in, in the pillar of financial diplomacy, the emphasis, of course, uh, at the moment is um, the focus on change. We live in a world that is uncertain, complex, turbulent, and unpredictable. And that is causing, in, like in many other areas, shifts and changes. Um, but the key shift that has taken place, and this is really the, the driver, is that finance has become an integral part to geopolitics and international relations. And so hence the link now uh, and the emphasis between geopolitics, diplomacy, international relations and finance um, with uh, the world of academia and um, uh, training. 
and your your role within the uh, in the academy is uh, do you teach do you do you run it what what part do you play i focus on financial diplomacy and that means that um, i mean i i happened to join just before lockdown uh last year so um my um, excitement at returning to a university campus and the world of education and training um, was tempered by the need to do my webinars and classes from home, um, as I'm doing now, in fact. Um, but um, yes, there is an element of teaching, uh, but the bulk is actually thematically driven uh, webinars, uh, training, and um, most recently, uh, the annual BDA journal, um, which will be published in, in, in May, uh, 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 took up quite a bit of time. Each um, head of a pillar uh, delivered a paper in their um, area of expertise. Uh, so it's publication, training, and webinars. And would uh, the BUB be one of the uh, a small number of centers looking at the area of financial diplomacy around the world? Are there others? Not to my knowledge, no. Um, for financial diplomacy as an independent um, theme, um, typically the world of financial diplomacy has been inhabited by uh, treasury officials who act as diplomats or diplomats who do um, economic work and as part of that they do services on financial services um, so I have been arguing that as finance again repeating myself but it is very important this particular development um, as finance becomes an integral part of international relations and geopolitics both as a tool of geopolitics and international finance as in sanctions as in debt instruments, as in uh, uh, changing the fiscal models in oil producing countries. Um, at the same time that, um, uh, that this is uh, taking place, um, there is uh, a need for the input of financial diplomats into policy making so that the decision maker is really informed from a position of expertise uh, i.e. financial diplomats understanding the markets, the mechanics of debt, the mechanics of trade finance, the mechanics, and how that impacts on the fiscal models of particular countries and their geopolitical postures. Uh, it, it, it's becoming, in our view, increasingly critical for policymakers to have that expert input uh, before they make um, decisions. So what role does uh, financial diplomacy play now and, and what role should it play in the future in, in global trade? Well, I always thought of finance and financial services as the plumbing of global trade. Um, and uh, global regulatory cooperation is an integral part to that as, um, the, as is the... Um, uh, smooth functioning of the debt markets and increasingly of um, uh, funds. Um, the, uh, my uh, uh, interest really always being an optimist is on opportunities. Um, and at a time of when we see a combination of factors, unfortunate factors, including the pandemic, um, the uh, threat to uh, free uh, flowing global trade. Um, it, it is incumbent, I think, on financial diplomats to find ways, uh, practical and applied ways, in which regulatory cooperation can unblock the uh, bottlenecks or the areas um, uh, uh, that are non-politically driven. So purely to do with um, how um, the regulatory regimes talk to each other, for example, uh, and how um, 
uh, 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 easier it might be from a market access perspective to facilitate global trade through um, financial instruments. And I think uh, maybe we come this we, you know we come to this point later on. I think one of the key drivers of financial diplomacy in the future is going to be um, to convince, in a way, um, regulators to become more agile and quicker um, in order to unblock the opportunities that exist in global trade. I mean, financial regulators. And you mentioned uh, your, your optimism. Do you feel that the pandemic has had any made any positive had any positive impact on uh, trade and on the way that trade is transacted? Do you think it's made it more efficient or effective? Um, so this is a question with many <laughs> layers, I think, to it. Um, the uh, well, you know, starting from uh, the shift to online um, consumer demand and the and the tremendous growth in online consumer demand. Um, clearly, there 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 has been a, um, a, a or the pandemic acted as a catalyst for that shift to accelerate. Having said that. Um, what has been worrying from a commodities perspective is, of course, the fall um, in demand and how uh, that has affected various um, aspects, whether it's geopolitics um, uh, and, and whether it is the prosperity and, 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 and poverty uh, agenda. So it, it's sort of um, covered a, a, a wide area. Um, in terms of the how the different um, ways that the different parts of the trade uh, portfolio, global trade portfolio, have reacted to each other, uh, have reacted to the pandemic. And um, my real concern, I mean, long after the pandemic, I think, I personally believe that the impact of the pandemic will be mitigated once um, if we find our way out of it, whether it's through vaccination or cure or a combination of both. So I do not, th I, I think the trends are here to last, to continue to exist. Um, but I don't think the impact per se on global trade is going to be massive. What I think is going to be extremely important is, uh, particularly with COP26 coming up, is resolving the inherent uh, conflict that currently exists between WTO requirements and the climate requirements to which um, the uh, states member of the United Nations have signed up to. Um, that is going to be, in my view, um, a very critical factor in whether or not the recovery in uh, global trade will be smooth or bumpy. As it is, there is a conflict between the two, and that needs to be resolved, and that has nothing to do with with, with COVID. And before we move on um, and talk about other topics, you mentioned that uh, sustainability and what what role does financial diplomacy play in helping resolve some of these deep issues around uh, sustainability, climate change, and, and the other UN development goals? I think the, again, the reason I mentioned COP26 and that conflict between WTO requirements and at a time, of course, when WTO doesn't have its appellate body functioning properly, so we have another problem there, but um, assuming that that is resolved, financial diplomacy will, um, uh, 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 hopefully will be a key player in providing both uh, solutions as well as uh, practical dialogue possibilities uh, between the different stakeholders and between the um, competing uh, treaty requirements uh, that I, 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 I just mentioned. 
Um, because without the plumbing, which is what financial service provides, trade finance being the key, um, uh, you know, without uh, that uh, plumbing working not only efficiently, but in fact more efficiently, which is why I think that financial regulators will have to be uh, more agile and quicker. Um, I think it'll be very difficult to, uh, to return to growth in, in global trade. So I, I see the role of financial diplomats and financial diplomacy in creating that space for dialogue through providing practical solutions on the what I call, as I said, the plumbing end of trade. That's fascinating. So they're, they're part plumbers and part brokers. But they're not philosophers. But they're not philosophers. <laughs> uh, let's talk a bit about Brexit. So we're three weeks into this uh, new world uh, in the UK. And uh, we've heard a lot about, you know, how parts of industry have uh, already felt very uh, significant impact, uh, particularly in uh, the fisheries industry. Uh, one area of concern prior to Brexit was the potential threat to the role of uh, professional and financial services, and their ability to operate in a post Brexit world, how uh, how what advice would you give them? Well, the advice will, um, by necessity, be in two separate parts: one for financial services, one for professional services. I think, um, for starters, we need to separate the two now in terms of the post Brexit approach to how to deal with. Um, uh, 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 capitalizing on the opportunities that uh, arise uh, globally. Uh, the reason for that is that um, financial services will rely very much on the uh, ability of the city and UK uh, financial services to be very innovative and very agile and um, opportunistic, in my view. Um, but that will require an open mind on all sides, including the regulators. Um, whereas professional services will have, in my view, a rather, um, a, a very different task, which is to break down market access barriers to recognition of qualifications and um, standards of service. So, with financial services, I expect a faster move um, towards um, uh, dealing with the fallout, or some of the fallout uh, from the adjustment required after uh, Brexit. With professional services, that may take longer simply because it will involve um, uh, uh, numerous bilateral negotiations on recognition of qualifications and uh, client um, uh, 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 service standards and so forth. But I think the key for financial services is going to be uh, just as the city did um, in its, throughout its history, but also in particular in the 70s with the um, uh, euro dollar markets and, the, uh, uh, and, and, and the, after Big Bang and, and adjusting to, um, to an entirely new world. I expect the city will find very innovative and creative ways of um, adjusting. The question is, will the regulators be able to actually match the uh, speed and uh, degree of innovation in the city? And uh, you, you mentioned uh, recovery and uh, there's sort of thoughts of that the economies in Southeast Asia who have been able to focus more on recovery and growth and less on crisis management for the last 12 months, at least from a distance, it appears that way. Is there danger that uh, not just the UK, but the West in general loses ground and finds it harder to compete, particularly um, as you said, with the city having a strong brand for innovation, uh, is, are we in danger of losing that um, to Eastern economies? Not if we are 
uh, quick of the mark on digital currencies and digitalization. I think that is going to be um, absolutely key to both from a defensive perspective, because we know that China is developing a digital currency. And uh, I think they tested in four provinces recently, and um, uh, they are well on the way to um, creating a trade zone that will use that digital currency. It's some time off, of course, but th 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 that is the direction um, in which um, Asia, uh, led by China, is moving from a financial services perspective. I think from a defensive uh, point of view, we should be developing um, the framework for digital currencies and digitalization, but also from um, a growth perspective, i.e. actually competing in world markets. Um, I think this is going, digitalization as a move is going to uh, be, um, in my opinion, a defining feature of who the winners and who the losers uh, will be in the future. It doesn't take away from the traditional uh, services that the city provides, but in terms of growth and new opportunities, this is the uh, brave new world of electronic, and in its time, electronic stock exchanges. So I, you know, by the way, anecdotally, when we moved to uh, uh, a digital or, or an electronic stock exchange, uh, there was no trading, of course, trading floor. And I happened to have visitors from the Middle East and um, we took them to a meeting room in the stock exchange and they kept waiting to see the floor. And of course there was no floor. And I, 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 I see digitalization as having the same sort of impact um, on uh, financial services. And I think we need to be at the forefront of that. And I guess a follow on from that, uh, the London Institute of Banking and Finance is one of the leaders in providing education for people seeking careers in, in the city. What, uh, what advice would you give us in terms of what we teach our students? Well, I mean, as a member of the International Advisory Board, I'm very proud to be, uh, to, to be serving on the, uh, and, and uh, on the board of such an august um, city institution, the oldest uh, banking institute in the world. Um, I think that ETQ, education, training, and qualification, qualifications, are going to um, be a key competitiveness factor for the city and the UK. I think this is one of the key opportunities post-Brexit, is to re-establish the positions that UK uh, qualifications um, used to have, still has in many cases, such as LIBF, trade finance, and so forth, as the gold standard in uh, delivering a particular product or service. But I think key to that, in my view, is to re-engage um, with the uh, agenda of competitiveness for UK Inc. I think we need to develop a coordinated, coherent approach for services, financial services. The cornerstone of that will be ETQ, education, training, qualification, for two reasons. One, that uh, uh, acquiring a, uh, a qualification from British institution, such as LIBF, will um, naturally and automatically invite and entice an overseas counterparty to use the services uh, of the city and the UK institutions. And secondly, establishing these standards um, will be the equivalent through education and qualifications and training. Um, and by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm also very keen, I've always very keen, uh, 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 been very keen on secondments and internships, um, uh, will establish um, a, a competitive edge 
uh, that is not unlike building a, the digital infrastructure. This is the infrastructure of financial services. And um, so you have both, you have the element of um, setting global standards, and you have the element of attracting business to the city through education, training, and qualifications. I think it's absolutely core to particularly post-Brexit, uh, uh, to the post-Brexit um, city, UK. Let's, let's talk, uh, if we may, a bit about the uh, MENA region. So uh, we have had um, a, an office in Abu Dhabi for two years, and you have got a huge amount of experience in that region. Uh, what are your views about the future of the relationship between the UK and the different components of, uh, of MENA? Well, I mean, post Brexit, it's uh, hopefully going to be um, extremely positive, optimistic and interesting for the simple reason that um, uh, we can now discuss bilateral arrangements um, with uh, priority markets. And many of these markets are in the Middle East and in, uh, in, in, in Asia and so forth. Um, so uh, from a purely mechanical perspective, um, i.e. the ability to conclude agreements, we can do that now. Um, there is huge, a huge desire on the, on the part of uh, the UAE and the Gulf generally to see Britain as the partner of choice and to see themselves as a partner of choice for Britain in the region. Um, and given the uh, number of British expats who live in the UAE, for example, given the presence of the educational institutions in the um, uh, free zones and some outside the free zones um, in the Emirates, uh, given the uh, degree of connectivity between uh, the financial institutions um, and um, the various er areas of investor uh, of inward investment into the UK, and given the degree of cooperation, in fact, between the regulators, um, it is absolutely in my mind uh, clear that um, we must focus on building on this very solid foundation, but we will need to do this in a very concrete way. Um, I'm particularly keen on topical themes um, in bilateral relations, because there's no point one side talking about one theme that matters to it when it doesn't matter to the other side at that moment. It doesn't mean that uh, the two uh, friends and partners cannot speak to each other about future possible developments, but what always leads to more success is success now. And um, there is a huge now with, uh, with, with, uh, with the ability of the British um, uh, 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 financial institutions to, um, to operate um, in the UAE under the, um, uh, or in the post-Brexit post -Brexit world, um, i.e. Uh, looking at opportunities um, beyond Europe. Um, I think there are, and, and at the same time that the UAE and the Gulf states are looking at change, which is very important. Um, I think the time is right and opportune to uh, advance a few concrete ideas, whether it's in banking, whether it's in education, training and qualifications, or in insurance and reinsurance. Um, so. Yes, I mean, I, I, I think the, I, but I think we, we need to do a carpe diem. I think we need to uh, to seize the moment. Mm. It sounds as if uh, we need uh, we need to think out of the box, and that's something that traditionally the UK has been very good at. But thank you so much. Can I just add two things to our relationship with the uh, UAE and the Gulf and? Um, I would contend also with um, uh, our friends and partners around the globe. 
we need to reintroduce the tradition of secondments and internships. That is what guarantees good relations with the leaders of the future in these markets and in these countries. That's what gives the UK a huge competitive edge because of the goodwill it generates. And critically, I consider training uh, to include secondments and internships. And through that, um, in fact, standards, professional standards are infused. Um, and therefore, uh, there is um, uh, all the likelihood of adopting British standards uh, increases if um, we train somebody in a city institution. But we should also be open and our official institutions, the regulators, the bank, treasury, and, and, and sort of generally really, the, the, the institutions um, uh, need to be open to the idea of sending uh, people out to uh, the Gulf, to Asia, on secondment basis to sit in central banks and in uh, capital markets, um, regulators, offices, and help them and support them there and then with the things they need. These are going to be absolutely critical to the competitiveness agenda of the City UK um, in the future. Very striking that in uh, our 140 year history uh, for seven decades of that time, we played a huge role in helping establish institutes around the world, um, which are flourishing today. But there were two things that we provided. One was a London based educational qualification but the other was the ability uh, to circulate between banks and to create a network of right. people uh, who all shared a common education. So I very much uh, agree with that, that having uh, access to secondments, internships, is a huge part of uh, developing the brand UK. Bashir, thank you so much for what has been a very stimulating and wide-ranging conversation and uh, look forward to catching up soon. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure the uh, uh, future is very bright for LIBF. Mm -hmm.